My favorite Roman character is Cato Eudicensis, also known as Cato the Younger. Cato was known for his great integrity. He also placed a priority on the best interests of Rome. He opposed Julius Caesar's um, and even uh, Pompey's. Uh, they were trying to become like the number one person in dictators of, of Rome. So he opposed that. And he put the best interest of Rome ahead even of his friendships. Um, he had some bad parts to his character, but if I think only of the good parts of Cato, which outweighed the bad, and if I ignore the bad parts, there are some great similarities between Cato Eudicensis and my guest today, who is none other than the William Lane Craig. Now, beyond dispute, I think it is that William Lane Craig is one of today's greatest Christian apologists. Um, in fact, um, I, I think he's one of the finest in the history of the church. Uh, years ago, I learned a lot uh, about Christian apologetics when I was just getting started by reading Dr. Craig's book, Reasonable Faith. In fact, I, I got to say, back then, I never read it, but I listened to it probably 20 times while I was driving in the car. And uh, back then, it was on audio cassette tapes. And uh, it was just great. I just learned a lot through listening to someone reading that book. Um, I learned a lot through viewing a lot of Bill Craig's debates and um, got a taste of debate. And one day I wanted to do it myself, but I never thought I would be able to do it. And um, I moved to Atlanta in December of 2004. And uh, I guess Dr. Craig was, he liked one of the debates that he had seen of me, uh, my first debate with uh, the atheist historian Richard Carrier. And he said, uh, boy, Mike, I wish I could mentor you in debate. And um, you did such a great job. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I'm moving to Atlanta. He said, oh, we can get together. And so we did for a little bit. And that was 19 years ago. And I, we've developed a friendship a sense, uh, a friendship that I treasure. So um, anyway, hey, welcome, Bill. It's uh, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Mike. That's uh, quite an introduction. Uh, Dallas Willard said an introduction like that is like sweet perfume. You can enjoy it so long as you don't swallow it. <laughs> well, I meant every word of it, and I do value our friendship, and I've learned so much from you. Um, and so thanks for joining me today. The reason I've asked uh, to interview you is because I learned of a, um, a recent interview between the atheist Alex O'Connor, where, where he um, interviewed Richard Dawkins, and I heard that Dawkins said some, had some really snide remarks about you. So the other day, uh, Debbie and I uh, viewed that interview, and it's like I, I, he said a lot of things, not just about you, that came later on. Um, but he said a lot of things during that conversation, and I just want to get your thoughts on some of these. So you mind if we just jump right into it? Sounds good. Cool. Well, um, Alex brought up Ayan Ali's uh, recent conversion from atheism to Christianity. Um, and is that how you pronounce her name, Ayan? Ayan, I think so, yes. Ayan. So she wrote on the why of her conversion. She was a Muslim and then a nominal Muslim and then converted to atheism gladly. And now recently she's become a Christian, uh, she says. And in an article she wrote, she says this, and I quote her, I have also turned to Christianity because I ultimately found life without any spiritual solace unendurable, indeed very nearly self-destructive. She also said, atheism failed to answer a simple question. What is the meaning and purpose of yeah. life? Do you know much about uh, Ian's uh, conversion and the story about that? No, actually, I don't. I've read the article that you mentioned, and I thought it was very significant that in the interview with Alex O'Connor, Richard Dawkins ignores precisely those elements of her testimony that you have just highlighted. He focuses on the political aspects of her conversion, 
where she says that the West is failing and that only Christianity can provide the West with the strength and moral fabric it needs if it is to resist the forces that threaten it. But as you point out, Mike, in addition to those uh, geopolitical concerns that she has, there was also this existential uh, quest for meaning uh, in life that the new atheist, uh, atheism couldn't provide. And it was funny to me that Dawkins in the interview uh, points out how she rejects these other faiths that are worse uh, than Christianity, like fundamentalist Islam. But what he doesn't say is that the faith that she rejected is worse than Christianity is Dawkins' own new atheism. <laughs> and she said that that's true. It was unfulfilling and didn't work. And so she has turned to Christ. Wow. Now, um, he said that, um, I mean, I don't know her whole story. In fact, I didn't even read that whole article. Um, I just haven't had time yet. Um, he said that both he and Ion think Christianity is good because it keeps other worse religions in check. And, and I understand what you mean about um, what you just said about Dawkins, his own yes. worldview of atheism. Right. Now, um, he says that while Ion doesn't really believe Christianity is true in the sense that Jesus is God's son who truly rose from the dead and can give us eternal life, she calls herself a Christian because she likes the moral teachings of Jesus. Um, do you sense that that is, that that is ca the case? No, no, not at all. Uh, and I think even in the interview with O'Connor, at the end of the day, Dawkins admits that she does truly believe uh, in the truth of the Christian worldview. And that's why he said it's not patronizing to, uh, to, to say that she is merely doing this for political uh, purposes. She's, she's not. Uh, and you have correctly highlighted that existential uh, motivation that drives her as well. The same sort of existential quest for meaning that motivated me as a teenager to look to Christ for the discovery of meaning, purpose, and value uh, in life. Um, he uh, okay. I I missed that part where he he said that um, he didn't think she was being patronizing. Um, oh, that's interesting to know because I'd heard. Okay, I heard from some she had a real conversion to Christianity, and others said, well, she liked Christianity just because of its teachings, but she wasn't truly a Christian. So it's in, it's neat to know what you just said there. Well, that's um, very judgmental to make a statement like that. We don't know her heart. And so how could anyone make so presumptuous a statement as that? I simply take her at her word and that when she says she believes uh, for these reasons, that, that she is sincere. Yeah. Well, I, I hadn't read anything about her. In fact, I wasn't even really familiar with her until uh, recently because um, I wasn't following the, the New Atheists. Um, and Dawkins did say something which was interesting in relation to this. He says, what really matters about religion is whether it's true. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is one thing he said that that I respect about him. Yes. Uh, you know, you and I have both debated John Dominic Crossan. Um, I, I had the advantage of seeing you debate him first. <laughs> but uh, so we both debated him. I also debated Stephen Patterson and Dennis McDonald. All three of them belong to the Jesus Seminar. And all three refer to themselves as Christians, but only because they like Jesus' teachings or because they enjoy a fellowship of a community of, of other Christians. I, I asked Dennis McDonald, he says, yeah, I call myself a Christian, not because I believe anything, he says I'm an atheist, but um, oh. I, I just like being around other Christians and fellowshipping with them. And John Dominic Crossan okay. told me, you know, he doesn't believe in any kind of a supreme being who is responsible for the creation or sustaining of the universe. He doesn't believe in an afterlife, um, but he, calls himself a Christian because he likes the teachings of Jesus, 
Uh, Stephen Patterson told me basically the same thing. He doesn't really believe in an afterlife, doesn't believe in the Christian God, but he, uh, in my debate with him, he called himself a Christian. Um, so I, I don't think they're authentic Christians in the sense that Jesus or any of his apostles would have recognized. But what, what do you think about these folks like Cross and McDonald and Patterson who refer to themselves as Christians, but they really don't believe? I think that they have a very different view of religion than you and I and Dawkins have, uh, that it's not about truth. It's just a narrative that you impose on reality to give meaning and structure to your life. But every person is invited and free to impose their narrative uh, upon existence and to live according to to it. So it's simply a subjective form of life that one adopts that is congenial to one's own personality and interests, but it's not objectively true. And here, I I think you and I are as hard-nosed as Dawkins. This is about truth. Is there really a creator and designer of the universe who made us to know him? Has he actually entered human history in the person of Jesus of Nazareth to redeem us and bring us into fellowship with himself? I think these are vitally important questions that must not be ignored. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I'm thinking of the Apostle Paul when he says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins, and those who have died in Christ are forever lost. Uh, It's like, you know, (laughs) and in fact, he says, if the dead aren't raised, let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Debbie said to me once a few years ago, you know, even if Christianity weren't true, I'd still want to be a Christian because I like the ethics. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mm -hmm. you know, if Christianity is not true, forget that. I'm going to go have some fun. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, you know, I think the wisdom of Debbie's uh, attitude is that the self-indulgent, hedonistic lifestyle ultimately leads to despair and uh, unhappiness. That's that's the great irony of it. This is what the philosopher Søren Kierkegaard understood, that the what he called the aesthetic man, the the person who lives simply for pleasure and for self-interest. Ultimately, that lifestyle is unsatisfying Mm -hmm. and ends in boredom, ennui, and uh, and despair. Uh, And I think that the testimony of people probably that you've known as well as I have who have tried to pursue that hedonistic lifestyle uh, would would agree that it doesn't ultimately fulfill. True, but I, and I agree with that. But if God does not exist, uh, and you don't lead a hedonistic lifestyle, that doesn't really fulfill either. If God doesn't exist, so either way, we're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> if God yeah, does not exist, well, so I I might as well have fun. That's the <laughs> and, first. Chapter in my book, Reasonable Faith, on the absurdity of life without God. Uh, I think it is impossible to live consistently and happily within the framework of an atheistic worldview. If you live consistently, like you said you would, you'll be profoundly unhappy. If you live happily, as Debbie says she would, you only do so at the expense of being inconsistent. And so yeah. it's a worldview that is impossible to live out consistently and happily. And as you say, then then we're really in trouble. Uh, you know, last year we started uh, started an apologetics group in my home. We meet like every other week. And uh, this year we just started going through your book, Reasonable Faith. In fact, this Saturday we're meeting and we're going to be going through that chapter, The Absurdity oh. of Life Without God. Um, so we're on that chapter like right now, um, our second weekend. So uh, that'd be fun. Um, Dawkins, during his interview with O'Connor, he says that the big problem with the appearance of design in the physical world, which he acknowledges is there, um, he says it's too simple. 
The appearance of design is too simple to demonstrate the existence of God. What do you think of that? Well, I certainly don't think that's correct. I have defended and championed the argument from design or for design in the form of the fine tuning of the universe. Um, this does an end run around the whole emotionally loaded and poisoned subject of biological evolution by going right back to the initial conditions of the universe itself. And you can show that those initial conditions have been fine-tuned with an incomprehensible delicacy and complexity to allow for the evolution and existence of intelligent life in the cosmos. And in the absence of that fine-tuning, uh, there would be no life anywhere in the universe, not simply on Earth, but nowhere. And Dawkins is candid in saying that we have no good explanation for this fine-tuning of the universe. He merely holds out hope that Darwin's success mm -hmm. in explaining biological instances of design uh, will lead to physicists eventually finding naturalistic explanations of the fine-tuning of the universe, even though we are nowhere close to doing that now. Yeah, uh, we'll get to that in a, in a little bit too. Um, you, you mentioned when you talk about the, the fine tuning of the universe, I, I've heard you do this many times, mm -hmm. and you'll mention leading scientists who put this forward. This isn't something that just Christians say. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is something like Francis Crick, who was an agnostic border on atheism, and um, Carl Sagan and others have said about the extreme appearance of, or the appearance of extreme fine-tuning in our universe, right? Yes. Yes, that's right. In fact, in writing my systematic philosophical theology, I reviewed or updated the material on the fine-tuning argument. And I can tell you, Mike, uh, in all candor, that of all the theistic arguments out there, this is the one argument that atheistic uh, secular philosophers recognize as a really good argument for the existence of God. Now, that doesn't mean that they're ready to believe in God, because they might believe there are other countervailing arguments, for example, the problem of evil and suffering that outweigh the fine-tuning argument. But they would say that taken as an argument uh, on its own, that the argument from the fine-tuning of the universe is a very powerful, good argument for the existence of a cosmic designer and hence for God. Um, you mentioned a moment ago how Dawkins says that, you know, we really don't know how all this came about even today. Um, some of the notes I, I took, let, let me just read what I wrote that Dawkins said. So speaking of the origin of the universe and life itself, he acknowledges that science has not solved these and says they may mm -hmm. never be solved. All we can yeah. hope for is a plausible model. And at present, he says, we don't have that. Um, he and Alex note the challenge of explaining how the first self-replicating entity came into being. And Dawkins acknowledges that the origin of life itself could have been a very improbable event. He calls it yeah. a, and I quote, stupendously improbable event. And then he says, it's possible that we're the only planet in the universe with life. However, he still thinks it's probably not so improbable that life is only on Earth, and he thinks there's life in many places in the universe. But he adds that life is so rare that we'll probably never meet any of that life. Um, in fact, Alex says we we are in an unimaginable universe. So what, what do you say to that, those things? Mm -hmm. There are different stages in the argument for design that need to be kept distinct because they're independent of each other. The first stage would be that fine tuning of the universe itself around 
uh, 13.8 billion years ago. The second stage for us would be the origin of life on our planet somewhere around 4 billion years ago. And then you have the origin of consciousness, of mind, um, in the course of the evolutionary process. And then finally, you get to uh, complex life forms like ourselves, humanity. And Dawkins thinks that Charles Darwin's theory of biological evolution has given a good explanation for the latter stages of that process, for the origin of biological complexity and humanity, given that life exists. But he's very candid that we have no idea of how life originated on this planet around 4 billion years ago. Um, He just says that Darwin's success ought to give us confidence that there is an explanation and that, that we will find it. But that's a false comparison because these are completely different fields of science. Uh, Darwinian evolution concerns biology and biochemistry. The origin of life has nothing to do with that. It is organic chemistry, that is to say carbon-based chemistry. And the challenge there is to explain how inanimate, lifeless chemicals can come to life and how the first cell could originate. And honestly, again, in doing my systematic philosophical theology, I did an excursus on the origin and evolution of life. And what I found is that the consensus, the prevailing view among origin of life researchers today is that we have virtually no understanding, despite millions of dollars and thousands of man hours invested in this research. We have really next to no idea how life originated on this planet. Uh, In fact, Dawkins, in one of his books, makes a very candid statement. He said that our understanding of the origin of life has not advanced, essentially, since the time of Charles Darwin in 1859. Now, that's, that's an incredible statement, because that would include all the experiments done by Stanley Miller and synthesizing amino acids and so forth that was uh, done back in the 50s, really those have bottomed out. They've not led anywhere. So this is a huge problem. And in the search for answers, origin of life researchers have tried to turn to outer space. If it's so improbable that it would originate here, maybe it would originate someplace else in the universe and then be brought here on comets or meteors or uh, asteroid collisions. Uh, And so they are searching the the residue of these um, uh, extraterrestrial bodies, looking for what are called biological signatures, uh, traces of life that could have come here, and none have been found. There's, there's no signs of life on any of these uh, interplanetary bodies, planetary bodies that, that come to Earth. So it, it just remains a mystery. Now, on top of that, neither have scientists working in the laboratory under highly artificial conditions been able to synthesize even the macromolecules that are necessary for the formation of life, things like Uh, polynucleotides, DNA and RNA. So this is one of the greatest mysteries uh, in science waiting to be resolved. Even if they could trace or trace it back, or even if they could posit it, it, that there was life on another planet that could have made it to the earth, wouldn't they have the problem that it would have been that much earlier in the universe that the improbability of life would have occurred, that it would have just made it even more improbable than it evolving here chemically? Yes, that, that's a very good insight that it, it becomes all the more improbable 
that it would have evolved so much earlier in the history of the cosmos before it was brought here on these interplanetary uh, bodies. So, yeah, it just kind of kicks the can down the road and doesn't really solve it. You know, uh, sometimes someone like Dawkins would accuse Christians of employing a God of the gaps uh, yeah. there to to fill in, well, how we got life. But it seems to me he's doing a nature of the gaps. Mm -hmm. I think that's very clear that he believes in a sort of naturalism of the gaps. He admits the gaps are there, but he's confident that somehow naturalism will provide an explanation. And that's one of the attractions of the fine-tuning argument, Mike, is that because these are initial conditions, there cannot be a purely natural explanation of them unless you have, say, a multiverse hypothesis, a, a mother universe that births our universe, and you push the question back. But given that these are initial conditions, the idea of a purely natural explanation is ruled out, unlike situations like the origin of life or the origin of biological complexity. You know, I want to back up just a moment to one of the arguments that you gave a moment ago was the argument from the problem of consciousness. Where did it, um, mm -hmm. how, how did that pop up in an evolutionary process? I remember during my undergraduate work, I took a intro to philosophy course and the one thing that really stood out to me, believe it or not, was the problem of consciousness. Really? Um, and in fact, uh, I, I know even Bart Ehrman, when I was preparing for a debate with him two years ago, um, he even acknowledged, I saw on a video where he acknowledged the problem of consciousness is a serious challenge to atheism. Mm -hmm. Would you explain a little more about the problem of consciousness? Yes, I just recently have been working on Doctrine of Man for this systematic philosophical theology and completed a section on uh, the reality of the soul and the problem of consciousness. And basically, the problem is that the brain and the nervous system is a purely physical organ that can be given a complete description from a third person standpoint. Uh, you can describe its weight, its density, its composition, the activity of the neurons uh, electrically uh, in it. You can give a description from a third person standpoint of the brain and the nervous system. In none of these descriptions will you find a subjective perspective uh, such as we experience, where I experience um, sensations like uh, consciousness, fear, uh, anxiety, jubilance, um, intentionality. I, I can think about things. And no physical organ has these kinds of subjective states. The, the brain is not happy. The brain is not jubilant. The brain is not anxious. Now, certainly there are neural states associated with those feelings, but the brain itself doesn't have those kinds of properties. Those kinds of properties belong to a self, uh, a mind, which has a first-person perspective and can say, I think that, or I feel that. And so, the challenge of consciousness is how do you make place, uh, make a place for consciousness in a purely physical world that can be described from a third person perspective. Uh, and that problem remains unsolved. Uh, and I, I think that uh, dualists like myself would say that the best explanation is to say that in addition to physical reality, there are minds, mental selves, or substances, which are the seat of these conscious states and are correlated with neural brain states, so that we are body-soul composites. 
Um, I hope that's clear. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. And I can see how it is a, a big challenge to atheism. Um, yeah. The challenge for atheism would be that atheists are typically naturalists or physicalists. Mm -hmm. And so there isn't any room in that worldview for a description from a first person point of view. Um, and so the most radical physicalists or, or atheists, you know what they do? They deny that there are any conscious states. They say that really there is no self, that I do not exist, uh, nor do I persist over time. It's all an illusion. So this kind of eliminativism just bites the bullet and says consciousness doesn't exist. Forget your experience. Uh, they just deny it outright. That is radical. <laughs> I mean, to me, it's just the look and, you know, if you have some kind of an amoeba in the, uh, you know, toward the beginning of the origin of life, how is it along the way that all the, I mean, that amoeba doesn't know that it exists. It doesn't think. It doesn't feel, and all of a sudden, somewhere along the way, it had to be something. Hey, hark here! I exist. <laughs> I feel. Yeah, you have to arrive. Now, what's what's funny, Mike? Is I mentioned eliminativism, another viewpoint that is a, a small minority, but it does serve to show the desperate lengths to which these theorists are driven. Is panpsychism, which says that everything, even omibe have conscious states, and we're just not aware of it. Uh, and so our conscious states are simply more complex than those of amoebae, but they also belong to quarks and lamps and desks and everything. Um, it, it's it's a, a panpsychist view. Everything has a psychological side or dimension. It's it's nope. just wild, the, the lengths to which people are driven to try to deny the reality of the soul. So then don't get mad at your laptop when it's running slowly. You might hurt its feelings. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, all right, let, let's move on to Jordan Peterson. Um, they bring that up in there. Uh, I, I think uh, Alex brings that, uh, brings that up. And he asks Dawkins what he thinks about Jordan Peterson. And, and Dawkins says he respects Peterson's courage in standing up uh, to Canada for free speech. But he thinks Peterson's view of religion is BS, he says, although he doesn't say BS, he uses the words. He notes that Peterson looks at works of primitive art and thinks perhaps they had some uh, primeval knowledge of DNA. Um, he says that's BS. But then he asks Peterson, um, Dawkins asks Peterson if he believes Jesus was born of a virgin. And Peterson answers that, he says, well, it, it's complicated and it would take me one to two days to explain it. Oh. And Dawkins says, well, that's also BS because he should be able <laughs> to answer with a yes or no. Yeah. Um, and it's like, you know, I'm thinking... Yeah, it should take you one or two days to yeah. answer whether you think Jesus was born of a virgin. You say yes or no, or I don't yeah. know. There, there are some other things involved like genre or, you know, but it seems to me it shouldn't take you one to two yeah. days to explain it. You've shared the stage with Jordan Peterson. What do you think about that? Well, I think that Jordan Peterson has been deliberately evasive about his own religious views. I saw an interview of him by Piers Morgan, where he asks him right out, flat out, do you believe that God exists? And he says, it's complicated. And Piers Morgan just persists, keeps hammering him. Is there such a being in reality? And um, Jordan continues to dance and to evade. And as I watched that, I thought, you know, if he answered that question straightforwardly, he would lose a lot of his mystique and the interest of the public in what he believes. It's precisely because he doesn't answer these questions that people are talking about him. And I thought if I were a 
public relations agent working for Do- uh, for uh, <laughs> Jordan Peterson, I'd say, don't answer the question. Just be evasive because it <laughs> makes you so much more of an intriguing, interesting individual that people are going to be talking about and and watching to see what you think. So I I don't know why he's so evasive. Uh, I I don't want to speculate, but it, it certainly is true that I think he could give more straightforward answers like the ones that Dawkins wants. Yeah, I can see the thing about the public relations. Uh, that makes sense. Um, but then, you know, Jesus does say, you know, if you acknowledge him before men, he'll acknowledge oh. you before the Father. And if you deny him before men, you know, um, yes. I think it'd be the responsibility of the Christian to acknowledge Christ if you are one. Yes, I do too, Mike, and I'm not suggesting that this would be a legitimate tactic for a Christian believer to take. Yeah, I, di- I didn't. Uh, I didn't take you as as uh, as doing that. Um, all right, about the Dawkins book, the God Delusion. Alex mm-hmm. asked Dawkins whether he'd change anything in his book. Yes, and Dawkins said. But he's satisfied with the book, but he just add a chapter, Belief in Belief. Yes. Um, he says that atheists don't need a crutch to, uh, to believe in, uh, a crutch of belief in God. He says that's just a delusion. Now, my understanding is that a delusion is when you persist in one's belief despite conclusive evidence to the contrary. So it'd be mm-hmm. like a codependent wife who persists in believing that her husband loves her, despite the fact that he continues to beat her and cheat on her. Um, mm-hmm. So now I know that atheists appeal to a number of arguments uh, that suggest God does not exist, like the problem of evil, pain, and suffering. But has conclusive evidence ever been presented that God does not exist? What do you think? No, of course not. Uh, it's at least an open question. And I think the problem with the book, The God Delusion, is that Dawkins offers very superficial responses to traditional theistic arguments, like the cosmological argument, the argument for design, the moral argument, the ontological argument, and that when his missteps and fallacies are pointed out, rather than correcting them, he just ignores his critics. Wow. And as Mike, professionally, we have a responsibility to respond to our critics. If our critics publish a journal article in which our views are criticized, we either need to change our views or we need to respond to our critics. But we cannot responsibly just pretend as though those objections have never been offered and continue to restate and repeat the same original arguments. And I think that's what Alex meant when he said, does it need to be rewritten and put out in a new edition? Because Dawkins has been thoroughly and ruthlessly criticized, not only by Christians, but also by non-Christians, people like Mm -hmm. Michael Roos. Yeah, I had him in mind. Daniel Kame have said that the book is uh, scandalous, that it's so poorly done. And yet he will not um, respond to his critics or revise his arguments. He just repeats himself again and again. Now, Michael Roos, he's an atheist philosopher of science at Florida State University, right? Yes, that's correct. I I think you might be more accurate to say he's an agnostic, but he's practically an atheist. Well, um, here's here's what he said in an article that someone can say online. Uh, you can read it online. He says, unlike the new atheists, I take scholarship seriously. I have written that the God delusion made me ashamed to be an atheist, and I meant it. End quote. Um, now, I, I don't... That that's that's ruse. Now I, I don't mean to sound nasty here, but is it possible that Dawkins' positive view of his own book is delusory? 
<laughs> well, the way you defined what a delusion is, namely persisting in a belief despite having conclusive evidence to the contrary, um, would seem to suggest that, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, of course, I guess he could say, well, that's just the opinion of Michael Roos and this other person you mentioned, but it, it doesn't mean that it's conclusive. Um, I guess he could always argue that. But all right, he says that Dawkins says that grounding morality in the Bible is an appalling thing to do. Uh, mm -hmm. He says the Sermon on the Mount is very nice, but much in the Old Testament is appalling. Even some things in the New Testament are appalling. Uh, for example, the idea is that we're all born in sin and that one is saved only by Jesus' death. He says that these are hideous ideas. Thoughts? Well, I think certainly there are things in the Bible that are morally repugnant, that are, are horrifying. I've written myself on the command that God gives to Israel to drive the Canaanites out of the land uh, of promise and to dispossess them of the land and to kill any of them, uh, men, women, and children who refuse to leave. And that's pretty appalling. But that, I'll tell you, Mike, sincerely, that needs to be seen against the great moral truths and the beauty of the Bible, especially when contrasted with the pagan religions of the ancient world. It, it's like uh, a whole different realm. The, the, the only reason these appalling passages appear appalling is because they're in contrast to the great beauty and supremacy of the ethical teachings that characterize most of the Old and the New Testament. So it may be like a modern example in the U.S. It, it'd be like, um, hey, if you're part of Hamas and you live here in the U.S., get out. You, you've got one week to pack up and get out. Would, it, would that be something? Oh. Um, well, the, the, you're speed driving out the Canaanites, the, yeah. you drive Hamas in that way. Yes, the, the, the difference would be if they refuse to leave, what would you do to them? Would yeah. you? Okay. Um, now, I think in our modern society, what we would do is we would prosecute them uh, in the court of law before an impartial jury. And in that case, they might be found guilty of murder and terrorism uh, and sentenced to death. We, we do have capital punishment. And so these Canaanites were regarded as guilty of capital crimes, the adults, I mean, and so we're under, in a sense, the death sentence of God. He, as the Supreme Judge, had adjudicated the case and found them guilty. And he used Israel as his instrument of judgment to bring that capital sentence on, on these people. And so that would be similar if we caught terrorists in this country and, and said, you either get out or we're going to prosecute you, and seek the death penalty. Now, you clarified that a moment ago by saying adults. Um, right. I mean, not the children. And I agree with you, the fact that the Old Testament talks about killing not only the men, but also the women and the children. That is, mm -hmm. that is a tough pill to swallow. There's no question oh. about that. Yeah. Um, I'm thankful for people like uh, Paul Copan, Matthew Flanagan, and others who have you know, really trying to tackle that. But um, yeah. yeah, it's there's no question. It's a, it's a tough one. Paul takes a different view than I do. He regards this as hyperbolic language. For example, uh, to give a homely example, uh, someone might say that the Kansas City Chiefs slaughtered the Ravens in their football game, but they don't. Hey, don't talk do about that. Ravens. I'm from Baltimore. I'm, I'm still kind of Oh, oh, I'm sorry, game. I forgot. <laughs> oh. well, Not only about it. You, you know, get it, the point of using I got the point, yeah. 
<laughs> and, and what Paul thinks is that when you look at especially military conquest in the ancient Near East, that these kings and rulers would often use hyperbolic language that I have conquered every nation under heaven and under the whole of the sky. I am uh, supreme and I have uh, killed all of my enemies. Well, that's not really true but it, it serves its purpose. Um, I'm not persuaded that that's the best interpretation of these passages. I prefer to grab the bull by the horn. And uh, what I try to do is to offer an ethical theory, namely divine command morality, which shows that there is no inconsistency between God's being all loving and all good and his issuing this dreadful command. Um, and I, People like Dawkins have still yet to respond to my ethical theory or my uh, defense of, of the justice of God's command. Instead, all they do is emote in response to it. They just react with denunciation and emotion. Um, but in our debate in Australia, for example, Lawrence Krauss, who is Dawkins' sidekick, admitted in our debate that I had succeeded in showing that there was no inconsistency between God's being all loving and all good and his issuing this command. So I took that as a, an admission of victory on the part of my defense. Yeah, if I remember, Krauss wasn't, he wasn't the nicest debate opponent you've ever had, right? <laughs> he was one of the meanest. <laughs> yeah. Um. You know, Alex talked about theology, he says he finds it helpful for a few reasons. One of the things is it helps with uh, psychology. It, it, uh, hey, Mike, can I say one more thing? Yeah. About the, the situation with the Canaanites. I think it's really important to understand what this is an objection to. It's not an objection to the existence of God. It's not an objection to God's being a source of morality. Rather, as Dawkins himself, I think, very clearly sees and states in his interview with O'Connor, it's an objection to biblical inerrancy. Mm. Uh, Dawkins thinks that the theologian should say, in response to this, these events never happened. These are just legends, legendary stories, uh, and, and therefore uh, they do not impugn. The, the character of God. And so what that requires is not giving up God's existence, God's goodness, or anything rather as Dawkins sees, uh, the theologian would simply give up biblical inerrancy. Uh, and that makes the objection a whole lot less serious, even if it's valid. Yeah, it seems to me that like the worst case scenario, like you are saying here, is that one could say, we're looking at religio-political propaganda meant yeah. to justify the brutal acts of, a, of an Israelite king. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it would call into question biblical inerrancy, maybe some understandings of biblical inspiration, but it wouldn't mm -hmm. necessarily call into question the truth of Christianity, which is more or less tied to Jesus and his resurrection. Exactly. And to his credit, and to my surprise, Dawkins saw that very clearly in his interview with O'Connor. Hmm. Um, okay. So O'Connor does say that uh, theology helps with psychology for him hmm. because it addresses the question of how individuals come to believe religious stuff. Now, I don't recall if it was Alex or Dawkins who said that Thomas theologian uh, Thomas theologians have no greater status than theologians of other religions, but then said science, on the other hand, is universal because it's not tied to any particular tribe. Bill, is science universal in that sense? Are there no tribes with scientists? Well, I do think that contemporary modern science is a worldwide enterprise. Uh, there is no American science or Indian or Australian or Chinese science. This is a, a worldwide enterprise, uh, and there are journals in every language that publish their results and 
can be cited and read by researchers in other fields. So I do think it's it's a universal enterprise, but of course, there are different scientific theories, as we've just been talking about, different scientific theories of the origin of life, uh, for example, or different theories of evolutionary biology. And these are not universal. These certainly compete with each other and sometimes very heatedly so. Uh, I mean, uh, in cosmology, the area I'm most interested in, the debates between the old steady state theorists of the 1950s and the Big Bang theorists were very heated and acrimonious. Uh, So while science may be universal, there's certainly no unanimity among scientific theorizing. Okay. Um, Going on and transitioning now, they they talk about debates. And uh, Dawkins brings up uh, a debate that Alex had been involved in at Oxford Union. He he participated in it just a few weeks before uh, their interview. And Dawkins says he thought Alex lost the debate. Alex agreed. And then oh. uh, Dawkins said that he doesn't like debate because debates are often won by the amusing wit of one of the participants. And he said he'd prefer to think the success of the new atheists is due to their good arguments rather than Christopher Hitchens' ability to impress and get people to laugh. Mm -hmm. Um, Alex replied, he said that he doesn't have a problem with the use of good rhetoric, but he thinks debates leave too much room for rhetoric. Um, Mm -hmm. Dawkins said that he would like to have a discussion on God's existence with an honest attempt at dialogue, but he didn't Mm -hmm. want to do it in a debate format. Mm -hmm. Um, And then Alex asked Dawkins, whom he thought was his most formidable debate opponent on God's existence, and Dawkins said that there weren't any. Uh, Any any thoughts? Boy, there's a lot there, Mike, to respond to. I am very partial to debate because it allows each participant to lay out a carefully crafted, sustained case without interruption by the other uh, uh, opponent, and then to have rebuttals to the cases and rebuttals to the counter rebuttals so that it facilitates a very good academic exchange on the issues. And I think, as you know from viewing the debates I'm participating in, they're not about amusing one-liners or or rhetorical ploys. These are academic exchanges. Um, The kind of debate that I participated in in high school and college was um, forensic academic debate, where we would debate political issues, questions of public policy, Uh, And it's not about rhetoric and one-line zingers and so forth. So when I was invited to debate Christopher Hitchens at Biola University years ago, I declined precisely because I thought that I didn't want to go up against Christopher Hitchens' purple prose and rhetorical tricks that he would use to turn the audience. I I had no confidence in his ability to have an intelligent discussion. Well, Craig Hazen at Biola said, Bill, please, we can't find an opponent. And the students are already on the hook for $12,000 for Christopher Hitchens honorarium. And that will be lost if the debate doesn't happen, please. And so I said, all right, Craig, I'll do it. And As it turned out, that was a really wise decision because that debate has been viewed, I think, more than any other debate that I've participated in. And I think you'll agree that it was conducted in a civil and um, academic way, focused on an exchange of arguments. 
Uh, and I, I thought it went very well from the uh, standpoint of the Christian theist. So this is a big concern. My, I think the debates in which I've done most poorly have been debates where the opponent uses humor to mock uh, sarcasm, uh, mm. to make fun of the Christian worldview. I had a debate with a philosopher at the University of Leeds once who was just so dripping with sarcasm and the sort of British dry wit and had the audience laughing and uh, mocking and it, it was really, it was very, very frustrating for me because I knew I couldn't match him in his dry British wit, and I didn't even want to try. So I stuck to the issues as best I could, but I felt, oh, just drained afterwards and so dry because of that experience. So there is that that danger of running into someone who will try to twist things by using humor and rhetoric to move the audience. Um, but I, I have to say that's not generally been my experience. I, I find that if I approach the issues in a philosophically or historically responsible way, my opponent will typically answer in the same way. Now, finally, as to dialogues. I participated in those as well. And I think many people do like dialogues better than debates because they're more conversational mm -hmm. and they like just people having a conversation uh, and that can be very profitable as well. But Dawkins claim that he has never participated in a debate with a, a, an opponent that has bested him, I think Virtually everyone would disagree with that. It is virtually universally recognized that John Lennox, for example, really took Dawkins to the woodshed in the debate that they had. And I recently saw Dawkins on stage with Richard Swinburne in a dialogue in London, where again, Swinburne just dismantled wow. uh, Richard Dawkins arguments. And, and all Dawkins could do was, as I said, just repeat the same old arguments, but without responding to the criticisms that people like Swinburne were offering. And in fact, actually, I would say, Mike, you're talking of dialogues. I think Alex O'Connor just took Dawkins to pieces. I agree. In, this interview, in a very gentle and quiet way. I, I'm not sure Dawkins realized <laughs> that Alex O'Connor was really eviscerating him um, because he was so nice. But that would be a great example of, of a, a dialogue that Dawkins didn't do very well in. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, and I agree with you about John Lennox. I, I think uh, I watched that. I thought Lennox did a masterful job. Um, he was kind. He was brilliant. I, I will say, though, I, I thought the format was unfair uh, for, for Dawkins. Uh, it was designed clearly to favor John. If I remember right, you know, they would ask a question, Dawkins would answer it, and then Lennox got an opportunity to respond to Dawkins but then Dawkins could not respond to his criticisms and it frustrated oh. Dawkins. And, and I can understand that. That just, that seemed like it was set up unfairly. Yeah, I, I thoroughly agree with you, Mike. These things have to be fair. Otherwise the audience will perceive that and, um, and, and, and you haven't achieved anything in, in a case like that. So uh, you're absolutely right. You need to have equal time and uh, a lever pl level playing field. Um, so Dawkins said he doesn't like debates like when a professional debater says, um, you know, you didn't answer premise one, deduction two. Um, uh -huh. and, and I can kind of empathize with that. You know, if one is not an experienced debater, 
Um, it could be overwhelming when someone who is like yourself points out deficiencies in their yeah. response. You know, he didn't respond to the second sub point of my third argument. <laughs> uh, sometimes I think that di because of that dialogue, as you say, can be a less intimidating format and mm -hmm. that it's easier uh, for, for the audience ears to, to take it in and follow. Um, yes. But um, I don't know how you feel about this. And you've been involved in many more debates than I have. I, I've got, I think, 36 now under my belt wow. public debates. Um, but but you debated, you've debated a lot more than me. I kind of prefer the, the formal debate like you're talking about. I find, I mean, I like the dialogue one as well. There's some things about the dialogue, just, you know, it's a little more collegial, I guess you could say. Or, yeah. um, yes. But it's, it's, it's tougher. I, I find it tougher, um, especially if you got to come up with your own questions. I, I find that maybe the toughest part of it, to come up with my own questions, to ask my opponent Right. Um, and boy, you got to know yourself, your, your stuff. You, you can't fake it. You, you got to know it and know it on the spot. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, what, yes, what do you you're, you're right about the difficulty of engaging in, in dialogue because it is unrehearsed and spontaneous. Um, my experience in debating is that when you're opponent fails to address your arguments, he's shirking his responsibility. The responsibility, for example, of the negative speaker is to respond to the case that you've made. So if you offer five arguments for God's existence and he only responds to two of them, you should point out to the audience that even if yeah. he were right about that, there are three more arguments that you've already defended that he hasn't responded to, and therefore he hasn't met his um, obligation. Now, having said that, Mike, while I think that's true, I think you are absolutely right that my experience has been that audiences cut the debater a lot of slack when it comes to not responding to things because they just figure, well, he ran out of time or he didn't organize his time well. But but if he had responded, maybe he would have had something good to say. And so I think you're quite right that in the minds of an audience, um, failing to respond to an argument is not regarded as fatal by the audience. They are willing to be very generous and to tolerate that. So what will be much more important will be the cogency of the responses that he does give to the arguments that he does respond to. And if those are terrible, um, then he's just completely failed uh, because he hasn't offered very good objections to the arguments to which he has responded. Mm, yeah. And I suppose... Uh one of the benefits too of the dialogue would be um, you, you can't really say, I don't have the time to, uh, to get into that. I, I ran out of time uh, mm -hmm. because like if you point out the extreme, uh, the appearance of ex extreme design in the universe and he says, well, I think natural selection can account for that. And you say, well, no, that that's dealing with, um, I, I forgot how you put it, uh, evolution Biological. on one level, but not on the organic level. How do you account for how life itself came into being? Um, he can't escape from that because you can keep pressing him on that. And right. then he doesn't have the excuse, well, I don't have the time. I mean, you. I guess that is one of the benefits of the dialogue where you really could press yeah. someone on a point that they're not answering. Right. If you're good at what's called cross-examination, then you could be really effective in dialogue situations. The, my frustration with dialogues have been the opponents interrupting. Um, it's very difficult to get your thought out because they talk over you. And 
boy, Mike, I, I think if you watch talk shows on television, you see this evidence that the the people on television talk over each other mm. at the same time. And it's impossible to understand what's being said. So in my debate, for example, in Australia with Lawrence Krauss, somebody counted the number of interruptions. And he said, Krauss interrupted you 71 times wow. in the course of that dialogue, and you interrupted him seven times. So it's just really frustrating when you have someone who is not willing to give you the chance to speak your mind, but but jumps in with both feet and interrupts. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could see that. Um, I, I'm curious on your thoughts uh, pertaining to what Dawkins said about you. Um, why it, Alex asks him, why won't you debate William Lane Craig? And he replies, I have no time for him. He has a loud and rather pompous voice. And he says, I feel such contempt for him <laughs> because of what he says about me. Um, so <laughs> what do you think? What are your thoughts about what, what Dawkins well, said? This is really a very <laughs> funny thing because it's been documented that over the years, there has been a parade of excuses uh, offered by Richard Dawkins for why he won't debate me, uh, from the fact that I'm not important enough, I'm not a cardinal or a bishop, uh, or because I'm supposedly a young earth creationist, uh, or because I'm a professional debater, or because he doesn't have time. Uh, and then he latched onto this uh, excuse, because of my position on the slaughter of the Canaanites, yeah. uh, I am morally unfit and therefore, he will not appear with me on the same stage. And these excuses have been so shifting that there was actually an article, Mike, in Private Eye magazine about Dawkins' parade of excuses for, for not debating me and, and, and their inconsistency. And you might think, well, why would a, a detective magazine be interested in carrying an article like this? And I think it's because a detective knows that if someone who is accused in court offers a series of constantly changing, inconsistent alibis, then he has ceased to be credible as a witness and really brings suspicion upon himself. And, and I think that's what's happened with Dawkins. Now, um, the Canaanite excuse is the perfect excuse for him. Why? Because it enables him to assume the moral high ground uh, and look down on his opponent as morally contemptible and therefore not worthy of appearing on the same stage with him. It's, it's the perfect excuse because it gives him the moral high ground. And so this seems to be the one that he's really fastened on now. Mm. You know, I liked how Alex pushed back on on him when he said that, though. Uh, he said, look, a lot of the Christians you have debated, and, you know, they would have answered something very similar to what William Lane Craig said. Yeah, so, John Lennox, you know, for example, he would, he would hold the same thing. So he said, so why do you single out Craig as one you refuse to debate? And Dawkins answered, well, you make a good point, but none of the sophisticated theologians take a lot of things literally, such as Adam and Eve and the Midianites. And then Alex pushed back again, saying, yes. well, the Bible has many genres. You got the book of Numbers appears to be a genre of history. Genesis is more allegorical. So it's okay to take Adam and Eve in a metaphorical sense, but the slaughter of the Midianites seems historical. And um, Dawkins responds that you take it as history, which no respectable bishop would. But of yeah. course, that's not really an answer. Um, no. Yeah, you yeah know, I Alex, thought Alex, Alex just really, really exposed the phoniness and the hypocrisy of this excuse, 
because of the other people that Dawkins has already debated who hold exactly the same view. Uh, and Dawkins was really reduced to just stammering uh, at that point. Uh, I, I thought, when I watched Alex O'Connor, I thought, this is masterful cross-examination. He, <laughs> he is really very good. Yeah, I appreciated the fact that that Alex also said, uh, when Dawkins said you were a loud and pompous voice, he said, you know, I've I've uh, had Dr. Craig on here twice and interviewed him, and that has not been my experience with him. Hmm. Um, I think Dawkins misunderstands the reason that I lay out the logical structure of my arguments, premise one, number two. He thinks it's to impress the audience and that that's pompous. That's not the purpose of it. The reason I do this is for clarity, Mm -hmm. for the sake of clarity of the argument. Um, and so many students have said to me, your arguments are so clearly stated and simple to understand. We really appreciate that. And I've especially found, Mike, that students in engineering love this fact that I make the logical structure explicit. Uh, engineers, whether they're in mechanical engineering or civil engineering or chemical engineering or whatever, they love to have this formal logical structure because as engineers, you know, they've got to get it right. People's lives depend on the um, precision with which they do things. And so I find they especially resonate with my approach. And I think that by laying out the premises Clearly and simply, I'm really doing the opponent a, a favor. I'm saying my argument has two steps. That's all, just two steps. And if you can shoot down either one of these premises, my argument's dead. So which premise do you reject and why? Oh, that's good. You know, and you're, you are the master when it comes to debate, and I've learned so much from you. Um, you know, if I had to guess, I'd say Dawkins won't debate you because he knows that you know your stuff and that you're an expert at presenting and defending what you believe. Mm -hmm. um, he, he maintains the confidence that he's right, but he knows he doesn't have the ability to defend it against someone like you. Um, well, and personally, I, I, I see I, no I, shame. Hmm? I don't want to speculate about his motivations, but I was told by someone who was quite close to Dawkins that it really had nothing to do with me personally. Um, he said Dawkins doesn't want to get into a debate with a philosopher because he feels out of his depth. It's not his, his area. And so, for example, when I was in England doing my doctoral studies at the University of Birmingham, Alvin Plantinga was at Oxford on some kind of research leave or sabbatical. And the BBC wanted to have a televised debate between Alvin Plantinga and Richard Dawkins while Plantinga was there in Oxford and Dawkins refused to do it. He would not participate in that debate. And so what the BBC wound up doing was they got John Mackey to do it, who's a famous atheist philosopher at Oxford University. And we saw the program on TV with Plantinga and Mackey strolling around the colleges there at Oxford talking about the problem of evil and the theistic arguments and so forth. It was, it was really wow. entertaining and engaging. But... It was supposed to be Richard Dawkins, and, and he wouldn't do it. But, you know, I, I personally, I see no shame in if Dawkins had just said, well, you know, Planica or, or Bill Craig, they're philosophers, and that's just not my field, and I, I would just right. feel, you know, right. uncomfortable because I'm just not – accustomed to addressing that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, that that's understandable. 
Um, yes, I think people could horrible. understand that and say, look, in, in order for me to, you know, prepare adequately, it would take me many hours, which I'm just not inclined to give to right. it. I mean, that's just an honest answer. I think people would respect that a whole of lot more than would. just insulting you. Yes, or making excuses. And I think the difficulty for Dawkins, frankly, Mike, was occasioned by the fact that early on, he made challenges where he said, I will debate anybody, anytime, anywhere on these things, and I will beat you. And you can see videos of him wow. issuing these challenges, boasting that uh, he's going to hand you your your lunch if, if you dare to debate against him. And so I think he kind of put himself in an awkward position by making that sort of sweeping challenge that he then really couldn't back up. Man, such words sound kind of loud and pompous to me. Oh. <laughs> you know, um, you know I, I found your interlocutor, Alex, to be delightful. Uh, Debbie and I watched your second interview with him, and he just seems like a good guy who's yeah. intelligent, kind, and fair. How did you view I, your time with him? I, I really enjoyed it. I had my reservations about going on his show because at that time, he was calling himself the cosmic skeptic. And I thought anybody who would endorse cosmic skepticism has got to have something wrong with him. This, this is a person who is, uh, you know, out of touch. Um, but... He has since given up that moniker, doesn't call himself that anymore. And I found him to be just a wonderful uh, conversationalist, very open-minded, very fair. Uh, so had a wonderful experience with him. And um, I really hope that in time, Alex may come to uh, faith in Christ and um abandon not just his skepticism, but even agnosticism and uh, come to know and to worship uh, the Lord Jesus and God. That'd be wonderful. Well, what is a cosmic skeptic? Somebody who's skeptic about everything. I take it. So, uh, okay. The cosmic skeptic would be skeptical about literally everything, and that's self-defeating and, and self-refuting. Uh, the claim that we know nothing itself is a claim to knowledge and therefore yeah. it couldn't be known that you know nothing. So the sort of sweeping skepticism is absurd. It's, it's self refuting and cannot be consistently affirmed. Well, moving away from debate, Alex brought up CS Lewis's argument from desire. So he <laughs> says, um, you know, we have no reason to evolve a desire for food if no food exists. And so from an evolutionary perspective, how did a desire for God and immortality evolve if, if, if God and immortality don't exist? If I have a desire to want something that's not in this world, it must exist in another world. Um, mm. it, would you say that that is a, you know, an accurate description of, of Lewis's argument? Yes, I think that's the gist. Okay. So Dawkins said that he could see um, these kind of desires as an extension of Darwin, the Darwinian desire to go on living. And he says the, the, the person could be sexually desirous of a movie star, but they have no chance of, of, of getting it. And Alex pushed back. He said, but the movie star yeah. exists. Exactly. Uh, well, that's one of the zingers that uh, it happened so quickly. It was really quick. And um, so anyway, what do you think of Lewis's argument from design? Do you, do you think well, it's Well, I, I thought, uh, first of all, that Alex O'Connor's retort was just perfect. I mean, it was another one of those examples where poor Dawkins was just exposed as not really getting the argument. Um, but I've never felt the, the pull of Lewis's argument from desire. You know, it, it just, I, I understand the argument, but 
I, I'm more sympathetic with Dawkins in thinking that maybe God is just sort of a projection or something uh, on the naturalistic view rather than that our desire for God wouldn't exist unless God really were there. So Lewis might be right. There are good philosophers who have defended the argument, but it's just not one that has ever had a real grab uh, for me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. And in fact, it's like, now I'm, I'm not a philosopher. I've done the, the philosophy of history, I, I think I can converse on, but not the kind of philosophy that you as a philosopher kind of deal with. And so I haven't given it much thought, but, you know, hearing it pondering a little, I thought, meh, I'm not that convinced, but I'm going to move on. Yeah, but if you really thought about it, uh, maybe you'd be convinced, well, maybe, but I'm just not interested enough to do it. <laughs> ah, that, that's a real factor, isn't it? I mean, there are lots of things that you would like to think more about, but you've got to just move on and do the things that you feel called to do. I, I mean, to name another issue, I think gender issues today are really hot topics that are vital that Christians address, but it's not going to be me that's yeah. addressing these. I, I've got other fish to fry, and uh, I'm not going to embark now on a study of gender issues to address them. Somebody else needs to do that. But it, it just, as you say, Mike, you've got to pick your 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 battles. Yeah, I and I also have my political convictions, as I know you do, and we're I think from our discussions, we're pretty much aligned with our political convictions, but I, I don't feel called like I want to focus on them or take time out for it. I, I just want to focus on kingdom stuff. Um, yeah. So Alex brings up Alvin Planiga, who argues that uh, if everything evolves from natural selection, for example, our desire to, to survive, uh, why believe natural selection is true when the mechanism to believe so, uh, selects for survivability rather than for truth? Now, now this I, I find myself more interested in than I yes. do Lewis's argument for design. And um, Dawkins says, well, if you base your life on truth, for example, two plus two equals four, you're more likely to survive if you ba than if you base your life on nonsense. And Alex responds, well, how do you know that two plus two equals four is true rather than it helps us get to the moon? Um, <laughs> and, and Dawkins says, well, I don't see the problem with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you think? Yeah, do, you, yeah, yeah. do you think Dawkins is just missing this? Yes, I do. I, I think that's the case with so many of the arguments that he addresses. He doesn't get it. Now, this is planning as famous evolutionary argument against naturalism. Uh, and again, in writing my systematic philosophical theology, I got into this argument and I find that it's, it's very persuasive. Uh, the idea here is that the um, conjunction of the belief of naturalism and evolution, where evolution is understood uh, to be evolutionary biology and naturalism is understood to entail physicalism, um, that that combination cannot be rationally affirmed because if naturalism and evolution were true, then our beliefs are evolved for survivability, not for truth. And therefore, we can have no confidence in the truth of our beliefs. But if that's right, then we can have no confidence in the truth of naturalism, mm. because that was formed by those same belief-forming mechanisms. So the poor naturalist is caught in an ex a vicious explanatory circle. The mm. naturalism defeats itself, because if it's true, then it's false. And there is no way for the poor naturalist to extricate himself from this circle. So as you thought through this, um, and you say there's no way for them to extract themselves from this, this vicious circle, mm -hmm. 
you've probably, knowing you, you've looked to try to find a way. Do you see something that has any kind, like if you were an atheist, you might try to develop something from a particular angle to say how you could get out of that circle? Wow. Well, this gets into very complex issues that don't lend themselves well to a, a podcast. But at the end of the day, I do not think there is any viable escape. Um, you can't reason yourself out of a view in which reason itself can't be trusted. You, you, you see the problem? You can't use reason to establish right. reason when reason is being undermined. And so the only way to extricate oneself from this circle is to simply leap out of it. You, you just abandon the whole thing and have a sort of gestalt switch where you have a paradigm switch to a new worldview. And so Plantinga has said that, the, it, that this bears out the truth of the fact that salvation is only by grace. That's all that can save the naturalist from this situation is just to have this radical shift of worldview uh, through faith by grace. Interesting. Coming to the last part, the final part of their interview, Alex says to Dawkins that one of the reasons people are religious is because they want to escape the fear of death. And then he asks Dawkins, are you afraid of dying? And Dawkins says, I am afraid of dying. I don't look forward to getting cancer or something of that sort. No. He says, I suppose I'm afraid of eternity. It's a daunting thought that the universe goes on for trillions of years. He says, yeah. I like life. I'd like to go on living. I wouldn't want to live forever, but I wouldn't mind living 200 years. Um, I, got, I got the sense that Dawkins, from what he said, he's not really contemplated the futility of life if atheism is true. Getting back to your chapter, The Absurdity mm -hmm. of Life Without God, I think it's chapter two in your book, uh, Reasonable Faith. Um, how, what, 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 do you, what, what do you think ab about his... Do you, do you think he's... He's really thought this through. I mean, the guy, I don't know how old he is, but I'm, I'm sure he's, yeah. what, late 70s, maybe? Yeah, yeah he early. looks like he's 80s. Um, you, you would think if you're in the last quarter of your life, I'm assuming you'd even live to 100, which he probably won't. So he's, he's, he's well into the last quarter of his life you think you'd start to contemplate these things a little bit more. Do you, do you think he's really thought this through, the futility of I, life apart from God? I don't know, Mike. I, I hate to, I can't make a psychological judgment, but um, I admire his candor in saying that he is afraid of, of death and of the universe going on for trillions of years without him. The theologian Paul Tillich uh, spoke of what he called the threat of non-being. Mm. And I have to say, this is something that I have felt very keenly, especially as a non-Christian. Uh, as a non-Christian, the idea that I was going to cease to exist, that I would be no more, that this person I call Bill Craig that is so real and alive would cease to be, cease to exist— I think that's tremendously threatening. And I do think it puts a question mark behind the life that we do have. If everything ends up the same in oblivion, no matter what we do, if it ends up in non-being, then what's the point of yeah. living? I, I, I think that it does make life futile and meaningless and purposeless. So... I think the the existential threat of death and the threat of non-being should be a powerful motivation for people to ask themselves the ultimate questions in life. What is the purpose of my being here? Uh, is there a God? 
Where did the universe come from? Are there objective moral uh, values which I'm obliged to uh, obey? I, I think that the contemporary whatever attitude is superficial and fails to reckon with these deep existential questions. And so I hope that anybody that's listening to us today will be prompted and motivated to start to ask these deep, deep questions about the meaning and significance of life um, because they are profoundly important. You know, uh, five years ago, this month, in fact, five years ago, we had to put our beloved dog down. We had a West mm -hmm. Highland Terrier and we had her for 16 and a half years. She got sick. She didn't want to eat anymore. She had problems. And so we felt it was an act of mercy. We, we took her to the yes. vet and the whole family was gathered around. And um, the vet, I, I was holding the dog in my arms and the vet yes. put uh, a chemical in her that caused her to fall asleep. Yes. And I laid her down on the table and I was just stroking her real gently and lovingly. And the vet put another chemical in her and caused her heart to stop. And yes. he put a stethoscope on her and uh, said, she's gone. And he walked yes. out of the room and all of us just cried. <laughs> you yes. know, my wife will tell you, uh, she calls me Spock sometimes. Because, uh, she says, oh. you just don't show emotion. You, you don't, yeah. you know, you don't get that mad. You don't, you don't get that upset. Uh, you know, you don't show a, a lot of emotion. So she calls me spot. She's probably seen me in our 36, nearly 37 years of marriage. She might've seen me cry five times. Um, and, um, but she'll tell you that she saw me cry more over the death of that dog than both of my parents' deaths combined. Yeah. And it's yeah. not that I love the dog more than my parents, far be it, uh, far from it. Um, it's because my parents knew Christ. And so I have the confidence that I'm going to see them again. Um, but scripture is not clear whether we're going to see our pets again. Now, I know that you and C.S. Lewis um, think that we are, and I, I desperately hope you are right. But, I mean, I think you acknowledge that the justification for the confidence that we will see our pets again isn't nearly what it is for our fellow believers in Christ. Right. Um, right. And so the thought that my dog had ceased to exist at that moment, that just one minute before, you know, she was this dog that we had loved for 16 and a half years, a dog that loved us, and yes. the breath of life was gone forever, never to return again, that the dog just ceased to exist. It was a crushing, crushing thought. Um, yeah. I thought, wow, if that's the way it is with a dog, how, how worse it would be to have a loved one who you were holding their hand when they passed into nothingness, yeah, never to exist again. Yeah. Um, oh. it, it's like, oh, you know, I, um, it's crazy. And one more thought here along this line, I want you to comment. Yeah, uh, back, I think it was 2006, 2007, I had purchased the year before Dale Allison's book, which had just come out, Resurrecting Jesus. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I'd, I was saving it because in the spring, I knew I had a trip scheduled to fly to Maui, where I was scheduled to speak. And so I knew it was going to be a long flight, 14 hours total. And I said, I am just going to read the whole time. And I did. <laughs> and um, it's like, I was just waiting. And I scheduled so that this whole flight, I was going to sit and read and um get a lot of this book read during my trip. And so I sit down, people are still coming on the plane. I sit down, I'd been waiting months and I crack the book open and I start to read it. And I hadn't been reading it more than 10 minutes when this couple, older couple, probably in their eighties come and sit next to me. And the guy leans over and he sees me reading something and he takes his hand and he pulls the cover around so he can see what I'm reading, and it says, Resurrecting <laughs> Jesus. And then he says, huh, 
Well, now that we know that Jesus never existed, I guess we know whether he rose from the dead. Whoa. And he leaned back in his seat and just carried on. I thought, and you think you're going to get away with that? And, <laughs> and so I said, well, what makes you think that Jesus never existed? And he said, well, you know, that's what scholars are saying. Well, I said, well, can you name one? And oh. he couldn't. And, yeah. and I said, look, the majority of scholars today, almost all scholars, laugh at such an opinion. We've got a lot of evidence that Jesus existed. I, I, what leads you to this belief? What are you reading? And, um, and he just kind of wrapped it up real quickly. He didn't know how to answer. Yeah. And I remember at one point he went back to the restroom and his wife had this collar on, you know, because uh, her neck, something was wrong with her neck. Oh, and I uh -huh. said to her, that looks really pain, like you're in pain. She says, I'm in a lot of pain. I said, I'm really sorry. She said, but it's better than the alternative. And I said to her, and what might that be? And she said, death. Oh. And I said, oh, I'm looking forward to death. I, I don't know why you say it's better than the alternative. But I, I guess you guys just believe that when you die, that's it. There's nothing. You just go off into oblivion. You never, you cease to exist. Whereas I have the hope of eternal life in heaven. And and she didn't say anything. I was trying to strike up a conversation, but yeah, but yeah. It, it just reminded me of what Paul says in Second Corinthians four that you know our outer self is wasting away, but our inner self is being renewed day by day. Um, we have an eternal weight of glory in comparison, and we're looking for the things not that are seen, but the things that are unseen. And uh, the things that are unseen are eternal. And it just makes me so happy and confident about the, especially because of the resurrection of Jesus, about what we have to look forward to, Bill, with yeah. eternal life in heaven. It's like, I'm, I'm not fearful of death. Of course, we don't want to go through cancer and all that. But it's like, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to death, to be honest with you. I mean, life is good here right now. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to death. Well, yeah. what do you think? Well, I, I think that's fantastic. Um, I, I do think that the resurrection of Jesus provides us with a basis for confidence that, um, that death is not the end. But in one sense, it's just the beginning. Uh, and that then infuses our present lives with meaning and purpose, uh, because now we want to work while we can uh, before the end comes uh, and to do all that we can to extend the Lord's kingdom here on this earth. Mm. Now, you're, uh, I know you're 12 years older than me, so that makes you 74 as we're recording this, right? <laughs> I, yes, that's true. So what, what are, let me just kind of conclude with this. As a 74-year-old, I mean, you're, you're now in the last quarter of your life. Yes. What are some of your thoughts like? You know, if you had to look back, are there things that you would do differently? Do you ever think about... I want to have the right mindset as I prepare for death. Do you, do you contemplate on death? What are your thoughts about it? Well, it's so uncertain, Mike. I, I don't think it's very helpful to contemplate about preparing for it. Um, I, I want to try to do the best I can to maintain good health and stamina. I have... Uh, projects that I am engaged in that I want to do all I can to finish. Uh, it's been said, I think rightly, blessed is the man who dies with unfulfilled dreams, because that means you were dreaming right up till the end. You, you were pursuing a vision right to the end. And that's the way I want to be. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm just very engaged in the activity of the ministry to which God has called me and Jan and, and trying to be as effective as we can. And I, I don't know how that will end. As you say, none of us is exempt from illness or accident um, or, or congenital disease. So I, I, I think it's just not worth worrying about 
be focused on the presence and doing the will of the Lord right now and let the future take care of itself. Now, you, you said that, um, you know, you don't mind if you die with unfulfilled dreams, but you're working on your magnum opus right now, of no. philosophical <laughs> theology, uh, multi-volume set. And um, so suppose, you know, it's your time and let's say it's three volumes and you've got two and yeah. a half complete. Are you telling me you're going to be laying there and saying, all right, you know, I'm fine with this. You're gonna say, oh, Lord, oh, just I, give me I, another I really year so I can finish this. this. I really do want to finish, but I have, Jen and I have talked about it. I said, okay, honey. I said, it's, it's under contract. These other volumes are written. If something happens to me, you get this thing published. Uh, and so I, I, I do think about untimely death in that sense. None of us has a purchase on tomorrow. Um, and, so if, if something happens to me, I hope that at least this partial work will find publication. So you said it's under contract right now. Now we know Gary Habermas is doing his four volume magnum opus, the first volume. Here it is, February 2024. That just came out a couple of weeks ago. And oh, I, um, I, I think he's about done the fourth volume. And so that's going to be put to bed here really soon. You're working on your magnum opus. You have a contract. How many volumes is it going to be? I'm anticipating somewhere around five or six. Wow. Um, although volume and, two has two parts. It's volume 2A and 2B. <laughs> wow. When's volume? Frank Beckman says it's, it's like Thomas Aquinas's. Uh, summa Theologiae with the prima pars and the secunda pars. So I've got you know two A and two B, which I like. <laughs> so when's volume one due to come out? I hope that maybe by the end of the year. Um, oh wow! Yeah, it's that's your one on the doctrine of scripture. Yes, yes. The volume one will handle prolegomena, doctrine of scripture, and doctrine of faith. Wow. Um, volume, what, when do you think that you'll have the whole thing done by? Well, I anticipate working on it for another three or four years, I suppose. Awesome. Well, we look forward to that, Bill. Hey, thanks so much, brother, for this time. This has been kind of a long one, but I think people are really going to uh, enjoy what you have to say about these things. And uh, thanks so much for what you do for the kingdom, and thanks for your friendship. Oh, thank you, Mike, for your friendship, you and Debbie. And uh, I've enjoyed our conversation today. Thanks for having me on the program. Thanks.